so we'll mention relations, we'll talk about primary visual cortex A because it's crucial to understand vision, but also because it is, in some respect, a typical cortical area, not in all respects. And so it's useful to learn about it as a representative. So I don't know how many of you have actually ever seen a brain. This is a facsimile of a brain, of a human brain. So it's, um, it has almost a texture. It's a little bit harder. I mean, real human brain, once you remove the, the skins, it's sort of, it's quite soft. It really, literally is a bit like an overcooked, I mean, it doesn't quite fall apart like an overcooked cauliflower, but like a, a cooked cauliflower. And this is actually the size of the brain. As you can see. <laughs> so this is the thing that, this is, this is your world. This is where everything comes from, at least so we believe. All your thoughts, your memory, your ideas, your compassion, your love, your hate, they all reside in here. And specifically, we're going to be talking about cortex. Of course, cortex isn't the entire brain. It's what makes us hu uniquely human. But there, of course, there's much more to the brain than just cortex. So cortex is this big sheet here, or neocortex. It's this big sheet here. And it's something, I mean, it's by far the greatest expansion in, um, if you look at the animal kingdom, is in, um, is in, in, ma in, um, in, um, in uh, vertebrates, in particular in mammals. Sort of it's one of the hallmarks, a, a greatly extended uh, neocortex, six-layered neocortex is one of the hallmarks of mammalian evolution. But of course, there's lots of other things that are responsible for, uh, for, for keeping us alive and um, We'll talk about some of them, enabling us to move, to make uh, fine movements. But most of us believe that those things, that, any, that specific sensations, specific sens um, senses, the fact that I can see blue, I can smell, or I can hear, and certainly things like reasoning and, and doing signs and moral judgment and memories, all of those are tied up specifically in neocortical circuit, that they might need a lot of the support structure of, um, of um, outside the neocortex, but that the uh, neocortex and associated structures, particularly the thalamus and the basal ganglia and the amygdala and the hippocampus, together those are known as a forebrain. Uh, this is a term that comes from development, that the forebrain really generates everything uh, that makes ours, um, every, most everything about our mental lives and our experiences of the world. So we have to understand this, um, we have to understand this substance. So if you want to come up later on and look at it, it's a, it's a quite nice brain. I also have a, a real brain, but that's sort of layered and that's in, in, in enclosed in, 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 closed in plastic and you can't really look at it. This is sort of more, you can get some feeling for its size. How many have ever done a, a, an, an anatomy course? Who's ever done a human brain anatomy course? Oh, quite a number. So some of you have dissected human brains. Okay. They're remarkable homogeneous, right? I mean, it's difficult to see anything much in them. I was quite disappointed the first time I saw a human brain. Uh, so here you see at high scale, this is a, this is a brain from a, uh, from a monkey, but it, it's, it's smaller. It, in principle, is no different from the brain of a, of a human. And what you recognize, and the, one of the key features about brains, uh, about cortex, is that it's a two-dimensional It's a two-dimensional structure. Or as I mentioned before, a two plus epsilon dimensional. Uh, epsilon, um, that conveys a sense that, the, that the, the width of this structure is much, much, much smaller than the extent of it. So I, I think I mentioned this already. It's, in humans, it's roughly 1,000 uh, square centimeters, one cortex. In a macaque monkey, our model system is more like 100 square centimeters. So 100 square centimeters, that's like a you know, peanut butter cookie. While I think in us, it's more like, a, I think, a, what is it, a 1428? It's something like a 14-inch pizza. No, like this. And you've got two of them, and they're all scrunched up and put into, into your skull. And um, this dimension here ranges from, let's say, 2 to 3 or 3.5 millimeters in us and in, 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 in macaque. And it's a remarkable constant. So in a mouse, it might be thinner. In a mouse, it might be 1 to 1.5 millimeters. But, you know, compared to us, it's, it's 2 or 3 or 4 millimeters. So the, um, this dimension has varied very little. Well, this dimension has varied enormously. So if you go to a tree shoe or something like that, it's maybe a square, it's a square centimeter. Macaque is 1,000, and, and, and human brain is, um, sorry, macaque is 100, and a human brain is 1,000. Now, of course, we are not the biggest brain. We do not have the biggest brains. Right? That, that sort of distinction goes to um, mammals like, um, like dolphins or, or whales. They have bigger brains. The typical human brain will weigh between, I don't know, 1,200, 1,400, 1,500 grams. A dolphin a brain can weigh, or some whale brains can weigh uh, uh, five kilograms. 
it's, it's, so it's really important to understand that it's it's a really a, um, uh, a structure that involves in two dimension and the ev evolution seems what happens in evolution that it yeah, extra areas get added rather than anything here in the in in the width of the of the of this uh, sheet of this computational of this sheet of of neurons uh, changes substantially. In fact, there's a, there's a nice anatomy paper published 20 years ago where people make the observation that if you look at across different species from um, mice to rats to um, uh, cats, monkeys, and hu some human material, the number of neurons below a, a square millimeter of cortex is roughly constant on the order of 80 to 100,000 neurons. So the idea is that if you look at across these different animals that have slightly different width, not a lot, maybe factor two or so, that the number of neurons in a column of, by, of one by one millimeter, you know, from layer one to layer six is roughly the same, on the order of 100,000. That's a very good number to remember. In, there's some exception, like primary visual cortex it happens to have roughly twice the number of neurons, 200,000, particularly in its input layers, because it needs to represent the, the visual world. But that seems to be an, that's where V1 sort of seems to be exceptional compared to other areas. So they're roughly on the order of 100,000 neurons per square millimeter, and like I said, they are on the order of um, 10 to the 5 square millimeter in a in a in a in a um, uh, human cortex, and you have two of them. So if you add up all those numbers, I think you come something like 20 billion. It's a rough estimate of neurons in the human cortex, 20 billion, two times 10 to the uh, 10. Now, of course, in the cerebellum, there are more. There are probably like 50 bil billion neurons. Nobody quite knows what they do. So, so the estimate is on the order of 100 billion neurons in the, in the human brain. So what you can see here already that sort of this structure doesn't, uh, this cardio sheet is not homogeneous. There seems to be layering. And that's a very important observation that it's not, it's not totally homogeneous. It has these layers. And you can zoom in on them, and then you can discover some substructure. So this, is, um, um, this is all in the front and the back matter of my book, and I got it from an um, anatomist who's going to give you a talk here Monday at Caltech at Callaway, who's at the Salk Institute. So he shows two things here. A, he uses a stain called a nissel stain, a nissel stain that shows up every single cell body. There's some, some, something in the nucleus that stain, that's, picked, that's stained by this particular chemical procedure. And so you can see every single neuron in here. Now, and what he's done superimposed, he superimposed uh, six neurons that using a different technique, he actually reconstructed that then not only the cell body, but the entire, uh, the entire dendri dendritic tree and some of its axonal tree. So you, so you have to imagine that each one of those points, when you expand it, expands to something like this. So you can imagine it's a, quite, it's a very, very, very dense tissue. So let's look at some of these. So first of all, if you look at this, the predominant uh, feeling you get is the same feeling you, sh you should have when you walk through a forest. Well, what I mean is that you have this vertical organization. It's very typical. You know, the, you, have, you have this vertical organization. That's not to say that there aren't, like here, branches that extend horizontally. But again, the predominant orientation seems to be from top to bottom. So this is the top. Up, so this is layer one. On top of layer one, you have the, the, the various brain skin, uh, skins, right? the, the pia and the duomata, and the archinoidea. And then you have the liquor. And then, you know, somewhere up here, you would have the skull. This, incidentally, is taken from, uh, from a portion here in V1. Okay, and then here, the, this, is, this is sort of the gray matter, the proverbial gray matter. And then here, what starts here below layer six is a white matter. And what you see there, the white matter is mainly the myelin, the, the isolation sheath of axons. So axons are isolated, electrically they're isolated, using the structure called myelin. That enables the insulation, uh, enables the action potential, these pulses, to zip along at much faster speed than if you wouldn't have this, uh, this isolation. So that's where... Um, uh, the, the, I mean, that's, that seems to be the key, uh, the key uh, um, purpose of that. So, so uh, you know, all of this here would be sort of the, uh, the, the, the wiring, the white matter. So between the top and the white matter, you have, this, you have these cortical layers. Typically, in neocortex, you have six layers. Sometimes in older part of cortic, uh, cortex, like aleocortex or olfactory cortex, you only have three layers, but sort of the highly evolved um, uh, modern neocortex is, has six layers. Although sometimes people define, and if you read the literature, you'll find it very confusing, because sometimes people have 10 or even 12 layers. 
and you know they're looking at the same brain and it's like anything else if it's complicated enough you know different people you know different people even though they're reasonable can can sort of see different structures in here so here for instance you have more than six you have sort of these sublayers 3a and 3b and 4b and 4c and then c all, sometimes it's further split up into alpha and beta okay but one key point is you have this vertical organization so let's see, let's look at one of these cells here. So this is one of these typical cells, a pyramidal cell. It's called pyramidal because roughly it has a pyramid shape. And 70% of all cells of this ilk are pyramidal cells. So you have a lot of them. And in fact, when people talk about their gray cells, typically that's what they mean here, pyramidal cells. So it has a cell body here, that's here. And somewhere here, this is uh, the axon, I can't see where uh, that leaves. And then it makes these local branches. So this is the, the purple here is associated with the axon, the local axonal terminals. So it's like this, uh, this axon goes out, it sends the axon down here that then disappears. It isn't stained anymore, it disappears into the white matter and goes who knows where. For example, it might cross to the other side of the brain. It might cross into the, you know, through the callosal connection into the V1 on the other side. It might go down to the superior colliculus. I mean, we, and we don't know where that goes. But then it's like, it all, it's like you put a CC on, there's also a, a carbon copy of this message. It's sent out to local, to local parts of the brain in, in its neighborhood. This is a quarter of a millimeter. So, you know, this axon CR, let's say, within a millimeter, it makes lots of, uh, uh, lots of terminals. The terminals are not shown on here, but the synaptic terminals would be these little things called boutons that would be distributed on here. And then in t those, in turn, contact the, the dendritic tree of other neurons. And you can see, let's see, uh, same thing here. This pyramidal cell, another pyramidal cell, so it makes lo lots and lots of axons here, contacts here, some contacts here, and then uh, I guess it also has an axon that disappears. Um, this is an input axon. The black one here is an input axon. Remember the LGN, the lateral geniculate nucleus. So this is this relay station between the retina, pretty much halfway between the retina and, and primal visual cortex. So it sits somewhere down here conceptually in the basement, comes up here, and then terminates into this zone. It's specific. It goes into layer 4C. So although this looks relatively random, there's a lot of, and the more people look with better and better techniques, particularly with molecular techniques, the more specificity they see. Uh, so uh, typically the input here comes is confined to this layer 4C, which is maybe like 150 micrometer. This, layer. this is typically where the LGN input goes. Not only, it can also sometimes go here, but most, the bulk of it goes here into layer 4C. So typically layer 4 is the input, is input to cortex. So it, um, the layering is very important, and if you read the literature, people constantly talk about layer. They say, well, this is a layer 2 cell or it's a layer 5 cell. And it's important because it gives the um, layering, seems to convey... Um, what the new, uh, what what sort of um, the input to the neuron, the output to the neuron, where it projects to, a lot of that is tied up where in which layer it is. So it's important to to, to know. And once again, the take-home message is neurons are not just sort of excitatory and inhibitory, and otherwise they are in a, they are random net like many neural networks have them. But there's a great deal of specificity, and the more we look, the more specificity we see. Okay, let's see what else. Um, here you have, these, you have these pyramidal cells. This is an interneuron, an inhibitory interneuron, and this is an interneuron. I think this is probably an excitatory interneuron. This is probably a spiny stellate cell. So there are some cells, they are called spiny stellate. They look like um, a pyramidal cell, except, except they lost a big apical dendrite. So what's characteristic for an apical, for a pyramidal neuron is that it has this big dendrite here, here, or here. That's very typical. And some neurons don't have that, so like these. And typically, they, they, uh, they, they remain, they, um, projections remain inside, cort inside the local cortical region, which is why they're called interneurons. And you have excitatory interneurons and inhibitory neurons. So the vast majority of output from cortex out of, uh, out of uh, cortex proper, so down to the thalamus or to colliculus or other structure, involves uh, uh, axons from the pyramidal neurons or intracortical communication from one cortical area to another cortical area. All that typically seems to involve, almost always, um, axons from pyramidal neurons. So they are the big projection neurons. They project elsewhere. So they, whatever computation you have to do um, and rapidly communicate to other parts of the brain, it has to involve these, these, uh, these neurons. So as I mentioned in my first lecture, this is the, the, the main problem of all field theories of, 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 of um, 
of uh, consciousness, I was just reviewing one, so theories that claim that there's this consciousness field and this sort of, this collective, this field that sort of um, encodes or represents sort of the neural activity of the entire gestalt, of the entire holistic brain, that's what communicates a specific conscious content. And the trouble is, as I mentioned, there's no carrier for that. The only physical carrier that you have in terms of extracellular potential is tiny, it's much less than a, than a millivolt. And if you want to com communicate information from one cortical area like V1 to another cortical area, let's say in area MT, which we'll talk about, it's, a, it's another cortical area that seems to be specifically involved in motion, it's called MT, middle temporal area. The, the way you have to do it, you have to excite these neurons, and these neurons send output, uh, generate action potential, and those action potential get sent along the, ax the axons and then terminate, just like this one does, terminate in layer four of that next cortical area, in this case MT, and excite neurons there. So these, all these terminations are excitatory. So they, 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 from their synaptic terminals, they release a, a neurotransmitter, typically almost always glutamate, and that may mix uh, contacts with um, synapses on the dendrites of these neurons and excites them, and then you have this cascade of, 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 um, of events that percolate, uh, that percolate through the system. It's not true throughout the brain, but certainly in cortex, all the project, uh, not only is most of the output mediated by pyramidal cell, but it's always excitatory. It's always excitatory outer cortex itself. The only uh, inhibition is always local inhibition. There's inhibition, quite a bit of it, but it's local to cortex. What gets sent outside always seems to be an excitatory message. Yeah, so it's just pretty staggering if you think that each one of these points here, you know, expands into one of these neurons with all their dendritic tree and axon. So the dendritic tree is this red here. That's sort of where all the input is summed, where you have all the synapses, the synapses, you know, generate electrical signals, pass over actively, then they interact in very complicated ways. I've read, for those of you who care, I've written this big textbook, Biophysics of Computation, where we talk about that. And then finally, uh, all that information sort of ultimately gives rise to an action, to one or more action potentials that are patterned in time, and they are then sent along the, uh, the axons. And then they are distributed, those action potentials sometimes not always invade those those branches and they give, uh, cause a release of a neurotransmitter and that's how, that's how the, the information is passed along. This is now actually human. This is human brain. We know, of course, much less about human brain at this microstructure level for obvious reasons than, than in animal brain. So this is from a human brain. Again, you've got pretty much the same structure. Uh, here, as I mentioned before, you have these sublayers that you have, that's typical for primates, 4C alpha and 4C beta. In fact, remember last time I mentioned in the retina that there are two types of, um, that 90% that of, of ganglion cells that make up the optic nerve, they're actually two subclasses. They are magnocellular and they are power cells. I'm supposed to stand here. <laughs> they, they are magno and power cellular neurons. And remember, uh, 70% of cells are parvocellular cells. They convey information about color, and they seem to convey information about high spatial fidelity. And they, uh, they, they specifically make synapses in layer 4C beta. And then the big cells at any given eccentricity in the retina that have sort of large dendritic tree, that have big axons, send, go, go to the LGN, and then they in turn go to, uh, go to 4C alpha. And this, I don't know, this is probably like three millimeters for me. I don't have a scale down here. Probably like two and a half to three millimeters. So this is a collage. It's a collage. Uh, Brack uh, sort of, he specialized in Germany, specialized in sort of in recovering uh, these different neuron types from, from human brain, post-mortem tissue. And you can see he has lots of different cell types. Uh, depending where they sit and where they project to and where they have spines or not spines. The majority of are, are pyramidal cells. And then you have these sort of interneurons here. With local neurons. Yeah, I should mention really interesting stuff that came a couple of years ago uh, out. You can ask at the hardware level, what is the, you know, if you compare this guy, for example, with, um, you know, uh, Macintosh uh, 20 years ago, or with, uh, you know, Eliza or ENIAC or Maniac or some of those computers 40 years ago, um, after the transistor revolution, the basic switching components are always the same. They've just become smaller and smaller and smaller. And, you know, it's still silicon, it's still CMOS. Um, now, you can also ask the question, if you compare different animals, 
what are the differences at the micro level? I mean, there are obviously differences at the, at, the, at the macro level, but what are the differences at the micro level? If you look at a human or you look at a monkey or you go back, you look at a, a mouse or you go back and look at, a, let's say, a fly or something like that. And it's very difficult sort of to come up with, I mean, there are a few things like spines and myelinization that mainly occur in, in the vertebrate kingdom, not exclusively, but mainly. So as I said, myelinization, that's a great thing. It speeds up axonal uh, propagation. So one way you can get faster axonal propagation is by having a bigger, a, a bigger wire. The biophysics conspires to make that action potential go much faster. But another way is to put myelin, this insulation around it. And in general, that seems to be something that vertebrate. So that, that's one of the things that, that vertebrate have. Otherwise, it's difficult. Certainly within um, primates, or certainly within, sorry, within mammals, it's difficult to find at the hardware level something that's sort of unique, let's say, to primates or just to us. There's one exception, though, that people have now discovered. So it's a cell type that was actually first recognized by, well, I think Golgi um, Kachal mentioned it and von Economo describes it very explicitly in 1925 or something. These are called spindle cells and they seem to be present only in two places in the brain, in cortex, in a high level part of the brain, in uh, part of the uh, neocortex called insula and the anterior cingulate. And there are small numbers, they're only out of a couple of hundred thousand. Um, if you want to know more, you should talk to John Allman since he, 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 he was involved in this study. What the study showed a, f a couple of years back, that these cells are, seem to be unique to us and to some closely related species, which is um, Bonomo, I mean the pygmy chimp, uh, chimps, and either gorilla or orangutan, one of, the, one of those two. You don't find them in a monkey, you don't find them in a cat, you don't find them in a mouse, you don't find them in lots of other mammals they've looked. And that's exceedingly interesting to me because, um, I mean, you know, as biologists, we always stress the commonality of all living things, but clearly there are differences, right? I mean, if you've ever tried to talk to a mouse, you very quickly find out that we're not exactly the same. And so it is always interesting to look for, for at, the, at the low hardware level, you know, um, where, where are differences. So this I find terrible interesting, although we have no idea right now what, it, what these cells are involved with. These are cells, like I said, they only occur in two pla places in the brain in the cortex, in a very high level part of the brain that's involved in attention, volitional control, things like that, they are in layer five. So layer five is one of the output structures that provides output, just like layer four is where the, most of the input comes. Layer five and layer six is typically, particularly layer five is where the cortex sends output axons outside the outside cortex proper. So if you want to go, for example, to activate in motor cortex, you want to move, you know, I want, want to move my fingers, then I activate a motor neurons in, in layer five that send, sorry, I, I acti activate pyramidal cells, you have a special name, um, bed cells, and uh, those go down to the motor neurons. Or if, you wanna, if I want to move my eyes, let's say in V1 or in MT, I activate uh, an, another set of cells called minor cells. Again, they sit in layer five and they project to, to colliculus. So every time I want to do something in the world effectively, I have to involve um, neurons in layer five. So I do find it very fascinating, although we have no idea what it does, that there are these cells that are unique to us and to a few closely related species. And even those species like the bonomo and chimp, they're present in many lower numbers than in, in us. So I find that pretty fascinating. Otherwise, at the hardware level, as I mentioned before, there's very little difference between, you know, if I just give you a cubic millimeter as homework, you know, you each get to carry a little cubic millimeter of brain tissue. And then, you know, if you, if you would, whatever tools available to you, you know, supposed to decide whether this is monkey or human brain or mouse brain, it's going to be very, very difficult. Oh yeah, I should give you some numbers. So, um, in a cubic millimeter, so that's like this, by this, by this, you know, coming out, you know, coming out in 3D space, one cubic millimeter, they are in, uh, this is in mouse. I mean, these things are going to differ. But in mouse, they are on the order of 80,000 cells and 800 million synapses. You know, so call it uh, 10 to the 5 neurons and 10 to the 9 synapses per cubic millimeter. And uh, so that's roughly one synapse. You can think of it like a crystalline array where you have one synapse every micrometer. So that's a lot of, lot of synapses. And synapses, of course, where the communication happens and we think memory occurs there in the memory patterns encoded uh, in the strength of those synapses, whether you know, two synap a synapse between two neurons is strong or weak. And so you've got a lot of, um, a lot of synapses there. Even if you compare that against current sort of uh, technologies, 
like you know your modern your most modern chip, which is probably now the transistor. The gate of a transistor is, has a line width on the order of point. 0.15 or 0.12 micrometers. I think it's current state of the art for memory. I think it's 0.12, and for CPU it's 0.18 line width. So the transistor gate will be two or three times that. So, uh, but here you have an entire synapse that has a lot of a lot of computational elements in it, and probably has you know maybe on the order of a thousand different proteins associated with it. And you've got a billion of those on the order of a billion of them per cubic millimeter. And you've got uh, what was it? 2.4 kilometers of, of wiring in a cubic millimeter. So that's a lot. I mean, 2.4 kilometers. That's from, you know, that's from here to the base of the mountain, of axons. So these are pretty thin. Dendrites are thicker. You have 240 meters of dendrites per cubic millimeter distributed over those 80,000 neurons. This is um, again. This shows from a real. This is from a ferret, I think. This shows as uh, is, is a subset of all these. I think almost all pyramidal neurons. The tens of a millimeter here, and this shows just at higher scale um, uh, pyramidal cell again, and an interneuron. This is an inhibitory interneuron. So as I said, they have uh, um, axons here that make local synapses. In this case, within maybe you know a quarter of a millimeter. This is a pyramidal neuron. Another one. It's quite famous now. It's called Johnny Four. It's used in many textbooks. So this this goes to layer one, and here terminates. Uh, here's layer one, and sort of you, you would have the top of the brain here. Layer one is almost pretty much devoid of of um, uh, neurons itself. It's a very cell poor layer. But you have a lot of the feedback that goes from high level from high level uh, from a high level area in the brain down to lower area. Very often it terminates in layer one and layer two. So when you you know when there's a high-level message that's being sent from a high area to a low area, very often that that has to involve synapses in this part of in this part of uh, of cortex in the top in the superficial layers. These are also called superficial layers, layer one, two, and three, and four A because they are superficial to the main input layer, and then these are called the um, the deep layers or lower layers, layer five and layer six. This is a um, how do you call it? It's a on the pilot? No. How do you call it in a movie when you see a one minute trailer? Trailer? Well, I never understand why trailer is shown at the beginning. Trailer would seem to imply. It's... Yeah. Oh. Okay, well, that makes sense. Okay, well, this is a trailer, I guess, for a movie my, I'm doing with my brother, who's a, who has a company in Paris, Paris, France. And. Um, we had some we had some really cool ideas about flying through the brain. Anyhow, so the, here you fly through you fly through cortex, and I think this is an, somewhat unhappy with the artistic rendition. Each of those balls is supposed to be an action potential that zips up and down the uh, these axons and the dendritic tree. So I think, and of course here we only show I, I can't remember the percent. It's only a very small, like one or two percentage of all the neurons in that area that are shown there. But I think it's sort of a, it's a, it's nice. I like it. In your cin I mean, coming to a cinema soon. Yeah, my brother's company specializes in doing a high-end scientific visualization, mainly molecular stuff. This will be the first. And we've we gotten a French and a, a director, to, a French-Belgian director, to write the storyboard. It's pretty cool. It's about an alien who looks who looks inside people's brain. I mean, the idea is to, it's for a large audience. It's supposed to be ultimately an IMAX movie. Um, it's, you know, it's an idea. It's, it's a wait. It's a, supposed to be 14 to 15 minutes little movie f for people to get emo emotional engaged in. So it's a nice story. It's dark. I mean, this is France, right? So it's a very dark, somber mood. And, and uh, <laughs> first they wanted to kill off the hero at the end. I said, no, 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 no. It's supposed to run in America. You can't do that. You can't kill off your hero at the end. <laughs> Anyhow, so, and then... Um, and then as, uh, d d during the course of this movie, and there are lots of chases, etc., cetera, we, we, we show various things inside the brain, how it looks from the perspective of this guy who's being chased around, how, sort of how, how these images project onto his retina, onto V1, what happens in different parts of the brain. Okay, um, next year, hopefully. So cell types, so as I said, there are uh, many different cell types. I've, I've said this already. Um, in the retina, 
people can estimate even 50 cell, ty 50 cell types, and you would imagine when in the retina, all I really need photoreceptors, and then, you know, like in a CMOS camera, and then I, okay, then I do some local processing, and then I send it out over one output. But even that isn't true. There are lots of different types, and there are, as I said, eight or ten, eight to ten, or maybe even more different types of output that project to cortex, depending on whether they signal the positive part of the signal or the negative part, depending on whether they signal motion or whether they signal high spatial frequency information or color. And then there's some more specialized channel that go down to the, to the midbrain, to the brainstem involved in doing sort of household function like changing the pupil diameter and, you know, making my eye moves, etc. In cortex, so if you think, um, retina is maybe like 200 micrometers thick, cortex is 2 millimeters thick, so if you apply the same principle, you can already guess there could be many, many more cell types. And now depending, and for those who are interested, like on Monday there's this talk by Ed Callow, who's going to talk more about it, depends how you count, and it's still, it's still very early on, but it could easily be the, the hundred or a couple of hundred, maybe a thousand different cell types, and the, those cell types might differ from one area to the next, or there could be great, we know already the gradients, we know already if you look at the layered three pyramidal neurons in V1, and you look at the layer three pyramidal neurons in, an in a part of the brain called infratemporal cortex, which is going to be terribly important for us, and you look at layer three pyramidal neurons in frontal part of the brain, you see already that they are much more complicated up front, the same type of neurons. They look much more complicated. They have more spines. They have more synapses. They are more densely branched. So, so certainly you have, you have big gradients uh, cortex. So it's not that the machinery is everywhere homogeneous. And historically, over the last hundred years, there always has been this, this debate, this um, dialogue between, um, you know, splitters and lumpers, between those people who think cortex is essentially uniform, it's a universal computational machinery that evolution came up with, and then essentially it's the same in whether it's auditory or visual cortex or prefrontal or olfactory cortex, and people say, well, overall it's roughly the same, but then it has lots of variability, how many layers it has, how many cell types, where do they sit, where do they project to? And, you know, it's like anything else, it's truth is probably both. There's a, it's interesting hypothesis that relates to cell types, which was uh, proposed by Francis Crick a number of years back, which is called the tiling hypothesis. And it says, well, if you believe the brain is efficient, then, uh, and then in the, in the visual domain you see, well, each cell type should cover, if the brain is efficient, each cell type should only cover every spot in the visual field exactly once. Because why be redundant? If the brain is really efficient, then you don't need huge redundancy. Okay? And then, and so then you can say, well, how many neurons does it take to cover one particular part of the, of the cortex? You know, how big is the neuron? How big is its, its sort of its girth? And then, um, um, and then, you know, you average, you average that, that over the entire brain area, and then you see, well, if there are more neurons, they probably do different things. That one, you know, one, one cell type should exactly tile the brain once. And then it, whatever it does, motion or color or stereo, whatever it does, it can do it. It doesn't need 10, 10, uh, 10 of its kind. If you assume this tiling hypothesis, so the idea that the brain is tiled in these, in these neurons, and each neuron type tiles the brain, let's see, once, then again, you come numbers on the order of 100 to 1,000. So even if you say, okay, the brain is a little bit efficient, inefficient maybe two, you know, you need two neurons per type, still you come up with cell types on the order of hundreds. And in the retina, there, of course, tiling is much more established now because there you can count, because there we know much, uh, we have a much preciser understanding what the individual function of the neurons. And there it is, you, it, true indeed, you can see that cell types, typically one cell type will cover a particular spot in the visual field once or twice. So the, the take home message here is, um, there could be many, many different cell types, and we're very, very far away from understanding what they do. We're very far away from that. Probably where molecular biologists were maybe at the turn of the last century, 1900s. Um, because we can now record from these neurons, but typically we do, do not know from which neuron we're recording from. So all we can tell, okay, I'm, you know, blinding recording now here somewhere in, you know, area X, and, you know, I know... In a, if, if I record, you know, consecutive times, 50% of the cells seem to be doing that and 10% of the cells doing this. But I don't know, you know, which type of neuron I'm recording from. And that's like doing molecular biology or chemistry without knowing, what, you know, what, 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 what molecule, what, what chemical reagent I'm, I'm interacting with, which is probably not a good idea. But it's, it's uh, very difficult to do that sort of experiments, to record from a neuron and simultaneously discover what type it is, where it projects to. It's technically very, very demanding. So to a large extent, we're still sort of in the dark, very much in the dark. Okay, this is going to be part of the homework number, what, what one is it now, four? Three. Okay, it's next week. So we'll talk about, um, 
and you can get all the background there in, in the homework. We'll talk about the representation of visual space in cortex. So as I mentioned already, um, if you look at the photoreceptor distribution, it's highly, highly uneven. The fovea that covers, let's say, 1% or less than 1%, the central fovea of the visual field, is hugely overrepresented in terms of the in terms of photoreceptors, in terms of cones, not in terms of rods. And this goes on. Um, I mean, um, if, if you look at, it, at at every stage, that sort of cent that emphasis on the central part of the visual field becomes is either just transmitted on or is even further amplified until in the brain you come to the falling picture. So here, what we do, what what we do, what Hot and Hoyt did. So you have to, V1 is roughly this size. It's on the order of 20 or 25 square centimeters. So it's, it's a little bit like this. It's a little bit bigger, but not much. Now you've got two of these in your left and your right brain. And in fact, wait, do I have a picture? No, I don't. OK, so in fact, um, most of primary visual cortex, so all the um, algae output Remember, the retina, 90% project to the LGN in the thalamus, 10% project to colliculus and other uh, small nucleus in the brainstem. The majority goes to the LGN. The LGN on block projects to just one area in humans, in cats is different, in, to primary visual cortex, or V1. Now, V1 sort of um, sits, um, well, so it's sort of here in this, uh, running in this, um, in, this, uh, uh, in this canyon, in this sulcus, and it's a little bit like, so if you, if you take the medial side, you know, so here at the back, this is the back, right? So it's like, it's like this, so here. And then you take one, you take this calcium fissure, that's what's called calcium fissure, and uh, sort of you open it up and flatten it out, that's what you get. And the horizontal median is down in the depth of this canyon. So for, if you just sort of cut open my brain, you see sort of this is the inner side, this is sort of the, the lower and the upper lip of the canyon. And then if you want to go to the horizontal meridians, bury it here in the depths of the canyon. And here what I do computationally, I just flatten out that representation. OK? So it's a flattened representation for, for our view and co uh, convenience. This is at the outside of the, um, at, of, the, of, the, of the cortex. I mean, if you remove the skull and the brain skin. And this is sort of uh, uh, inside. And you can see it's like six or, or here. It's like six or seven centimeters. This is the visual field. And I mentioned already, of course, there's this mapping. The right visual field gets mapped onto the left part of my brain. And the left visual field, okay, so the left part of, 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 um, of both left and right eyes get mapped to the right visual field. This is crossover, which is true for almost all sensory modalities. This crossing. So here, look at, so this is a radial, um, a radial coordinate system. So it starts here in the middle, and then all of this half field gets mapped onto the, onto the right side of the brain. A horizontal meridian is this, and vertical meridian is this. So the, uh, you have this transformation from here to here, and it turns out to be a logarithmic one, which has some interesting uh, computational property. So um, the fovea gets mapped onto this part of the brain on the outside. And you see already this huge expansion. The central two and a half degree occupy roughly one third of primary visual cortex. So in me, the, my thumb at arm length is 1.5 degrees. So two and a half degrees like this. So two, one third of my visual, of the primary visual cortex is, is occupied, is just dealing with the central part of the visual space. And uh, roughly half is dealing with like five degrees, you know, this area. Half of my primary visual cortex. It's just dedicated to uh, analyzing stuff in this part, of the, uh, this part of the visual field. Then all the periphery, so this is the monocular crescent, right? So this is, my, uh, this is my nose. And so with my, let's see, this is the right visual field. OK, so I should do it here. So uh, everything here, I can only see with my right eye, right? My left eye, because my nose, I can't see this. So that's the so-called monocular crescent, right? So over here, it's everything. Here I can see, but beyond here I cannot see with my right eye, eye anymore. That's a monocular crescent. All of that part, look at it. Sort of, you know, it's take, you know, this little part of the of the brain here is dedicated with all of that. So you can see again, this is huge over representation, over emphasis on the central part of the visual field, and that's you see that in all subsequent structures. You always see this um, um, retin. This is called a retinotopic mapping. It's a topographic mapping, which means that two points outside the visual field, two neighboring points, map onto neighboring points in, in the cortex, 
and furthermore trichinotopic that it vastly overemphasizes the central structure. It has some nice properties, logarithmic, so for example, this is logarithmically related to, re to the regal dimension. And in principle, if it would be a perfect log mapping, you would have these things at, at, at straight lines, but it's not quite. And this is a blind spot um, representation. So which gets nuance, uh, which gets information from the, from the other eye. And as I said, neurons sit here. I mean, here you, you, you do find neurons. It's not that there are no neurons here. It's just that those neurons correspond to neurons that, that sit around here in the neighborhood here. Right? Because there's no visual input at, this, at the blind spot itself, because that's where the axons, the optic nerve axons, leave the eye. And then, of course, there's also this, so it's, it's this, um, this inversion is also the left, uh, the uh, up-down up inversion that the, um, because just because the optics of the lens, the upper part of the visual field get mapped to the lower part of the brain, and the lower part of the visual field get mapped to the upper part of my brain. Right, so this part here, this quadrant, this, is this one quadrant here, gets mapped onto the upper part, so this is, would be towards the top here, and this quadrant here gets mapped to the lower part. This apparently caused people endless problems in the 16th and 17th and 18th century, at the time of Descartes, because they were always wondering how that the homunculus wouldn't see everything upside down, because they realized about the optics that the picture at the level of the retina is inverted. So they had all these fancy arguments why, 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 why we don't see the world upside down. Because we don't see the world upside down because there is no homunculus there hanging from the trees or something. All we need is, is relationships. And although I w we once had one patient, a very interesting one, who had um, what's the clinical term? Uh, he had a stroke. No, he had a. There was an accident. It was unclear what happened, but uh, the end result was he had a bullet in his head that remained there. It's not good. Let me tell you. And. Um, um, then he, he finally recovered. First, he was blind in the first day or two following this, this, um, this mishap. And then uh, he re slowly recovered. He was like an early, like 50-year-old maybe gentleman. He recovered, but then he insisted um, that everything was upside down. He insisted that everything was upside down, that the world was just upside down. Now, when we saw him, this was like a um, year and a half after this accident. And, you know, he did all, you know, he didn't, when you say hi to him, he didn't do this, you know. I mean, it's not that, you know, it's not like a slapstick. But that, of course, very easy to account. I did this myself once in Switzerland. I bought these reversing prism glasses that reverse left, right, or up, down, and you can very quickly adapt to that, right? Within a couple of hours, sort of, you know, early on you make mistakes. Let's say if you wear prism glasses that shift everything over by 10 degrees, early on, you know, you make mistakes. You're just, you know, you're misaligned, but you, your motor system very quickly learns and compensates for that. <clears throat> so he didn't have any of these obvious, um, uh, these obvious uh, deficits, but he did claim uh, and we tried very hard to test him, but we could never find any conclusive evidence on it. And he wasn't hysteric. There wasn't any secondary gain to be gotten from that. And it, we turned out there were a few cases in the literature when people claim that things are upside down. Very often they involve lesion to the parietal cortex, which might have to do with his sense of balance. So it could have been that his sense of um, uh, balance was. And he also had trouble walking very straight lines. So maybe it has to do something with that. Anyhow, apart from that, there's no, there's no homunculus inside your head that hangs upside down to correct for the obvious uh, deficit. Because, right, how, I mean, your neurons inside your brain don't care about the absolute direction what's out there, right? All the neurons inside, they can just see, you know, other neural signals, and there's no reason that the, that the, the map in the brain has to have the same orientation as the map outside there. I mean, none whatsoever. In the computer, they don't. Why, I mean, why should they have, why should they have this relationship in the brain? So it seems fairly obvious today, so I'm, I don't quite understand why, where the deep problem was in the 17th century. Okay, now each of these, um, these are all neurons, of course, right? So each of the, you know, in each point here, there are many, many neurons. People actually visualize this directly using a radioactive technique called 2DG. So you can actually do experiments where they saw this sort of pattern, where they had, um, where, they, where they showed the monkey um, radial symmetry, they had sort of radial patterns and then they, um, they used a technique that essentially tracks um, metabolic uptake, um, uptake of these neurons with this radioactive sugar, and then they could later on, you know, when they killed the animal, they could look at, they could take photographs and see where it was sustained up, taken up, and then they could see, um, they could see sort of this structure here, it directly visualized it. So now what we're gonna do, we're gonna zoom in on one of these neurons anywhere here in this, in, in, um, in, the, in the visual cortex, in primary visual cortex. 
<coughs> now, as I mentioned to you last time, um, for many years, people, so the first exploration of the brain with electrodes was done mainly, I mean, not only in this country and in England, but mainly in this country during and after the war. And first of all, people discovered at, at um, Kufla, at um, Harvard, and Hartline, at Rockefeller, was that neurons in the retina have these radial, they, they like things that are radial symmetric, roughly. So they like spots of light. Small spots, large spots, annually, things that are radial symmetric. And then once people in the 50s, um, in the early 50s, began, uh, began to move up the visual stream into cortex, um, they tried, because that's what they used to, they tried um, to discover the visual selectivity of neurons in the visual cortex, and they were not having a lot of luck. So they tried the same stimulus that they knew they could drive neurons in the, uh, in the retina and LGN, but neurons in cortex don't much like, don't much respond, they don't respond at all or very low, or very sluggish to sort of diffuse lights or to spots of lights. Until, and I checked, it's actually, I mean, Schubel, David Schubel told me this story, who he and David Wiesel got the Nobel Prize for this, say it's actually true. One day as they were moving, so the way they, they stimulated thing, um, they stimulated animals, they had these slides where they had very, you know, black, and then they had a cut out for some circular sh shape. They put them in a slide projector because they didn't have, you know, LCD or things like that, put them in a slide projector to, to, to give rise to a bright target. And what happened was that as they moved, as they moved the slide into the slide projector, there was this, um, there was an uneven slide and there was a strong crack, this oriented crack that, uh, that, that, that ran across the slide. And they moved it down. And suddenly, brrr, they had this very strong discharge. Of course, a prepared mind, I mean, you need serendipity, but then you also need a prepared mind. So they immediately followed up on that location, on, on that observation. And then that opened sort of the floodgate. There was this paper that literally launched a thousand electrodes in dozens of labs throughout the world and it's now a classic, where, where they essentially discovered that neurons are incredibly selective if you use somewhat more complicated stimuli. In particular, what neurons like, not all neurons, but many neurons in V1 like, primary visual cortex like, are oriented, uh, things that are oriented and things that move, and all things that move. So here what you see, uh, a stimulus that can move, a bar that can move either to the right or to the left, and if you move it in this direction, it doesn't correspond. Uh, now what you do, you, you, you rotate it, and then you find, well, if it's diagonal, it really likes that. And furthermore, it really only likes if you move it in the sort of, you know, at in one o'clock. If you move it seven o'clock down here, the neuron, you know, hardly responds. So it's tuned, not only this neuron, it's not only tuned for orientation, but it's also tuned for direction of motion. In this case, in fact, the orthogonal. The, the optimal orientation of orthogonal, that's a very common observation here, the optimal orientation is orthogonal to the optimal direction of motion. This is called the null direction. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, this direction down here is called the null direction, and this direction is called the preferred direction. And there's, so many, many neurons have this sensitivity when they're very, sen you know, we're very sensitive or they're more or they're less sensitive, but they certainly care about orientation. And some neurons care about um, bright on dark, so they want an edge, let's see, a bright edge on a dark background, and some neurons, just like in the retina, remember on and off cells, care about the opposite. They want a dark edge on a white background. Some neurons care either, some neurons sort of don't discriminate, they fire to either uh, edge as long as they have that orientation. Okay, no, that's certainly not a stupid question because it's a it's a real issue. Yeah, so you have to use. Um, um, in fact, a lot of the early paper, early response were probably what's called multi-unit, where they probably uh, looked at the response of a number of neurons and nearby neurons. So it's a bit like in human neighborhoods. Are they oh, the the question was how do how do people know that this is actually one neuron and not many neurons? So and it, uh, the. In some papers, uh, now today we know it, but before we didn't know it, uh, people record from multiple neurons. So when they say neuronal response, they're careful not to say whether it's a single neuron or a cluster of neurons. This works often because neurons, just like people, cluster in neighborhoods according to social class or religious affiliation or you know um, ethnic background, whatever. So very often if you find neurons, it's a common property throughout cortex that like, let's see this, uh, let's see that like um, motion in this direction, then the neighboring neurons will also tend to like motion in this direction. And that makes your problem even more acute. 
So the only way you can know is doing very careful tests, looking at the shape of the action potential, for example. You can tell that. You know, are the, are the for example, real neurons have what's called a refractive period. So real neurons fire, when they fire an action potential, they're um, very uh, unlikely to fire another action potential for the next two, three, four, five, six seconds. They're refractory for that. So typically, if you have neuron, if you have a, spi a, a spike that are, t you know, very close to each other, you can assume if, if let's say, the two milliseconds close to each other, that that's probably uh, from two different neurons. And then depending what you want, sometimes it's okay. Sometimes all you say is neuronal response. Other times you want to make sure it's a single neuron. So yes, you have to be careful, but yes, there are also techniques that can tell you which one is wh whether it's single neuron or multiple neurons. Other questions? Okay, uh, yeah, this shows the same thing. People did a lot of theory. We discussed this in the vision class next year, but not here. You can model these by Gabor functions. So you can model the, the spatial temporal orientation of these things by, by mathematical function, but that's neither here nor there for this class. Yeah, this shows the point that I, I, I just alluded to in response to your question. It's terribly important. Neurons cluster. Okay, so neurons with similar properties, whether it's color, or orientation, or stereo, or even phase selectivity, more often than not tend to cluster. In other words, if you record, and you see that because you can record from one electrode and you go down, depending whether you go perpendicular or you know, at, at, at an angle, you can encounter neurons with similar properties. So this shows here, this is a, a monkey. So it's not a monkey, it's a slide of a picture, of an abstract picture of a monkey cort neocortex in V1. And these are two tracks that are made by an electrode as you go through, you know, sort of semi-tangentially through the cortex. And what this shows, what the uh, electrophysiologist recorded here, A is the preferred orientation. So this, you know, this is the preferred orientation of the neuron here, of the, or the neurons here. And so if you just, uh, let's just look at the orientation. Here it's pretty much vertical, right? So the optimal stimulus is this. And then as it goes along, it shifts. You can see it systematically shifts. Here, and then here it goes back again. Okay, same thing here. So it shifts systematically, and there it goes back again. And now if you look at below a column, okay, if you go, you know, if you stay in this column, you can see here and here, here and here, ah, okay, for, for, uh, layer 4 is different, here and here, the orientation is the same. So the basic rule is, and this is called a columnar property, and it's really terribly important. But in a column, so as I said, the uh, cortex, you have this, this two dim plus n epsilon dimensional uh, structure. So imagine this is layer one, and with my feet, I'm in layer six, and my head is in layer two. And so the, um, to first extend, most of the neurons in, the, in one column tend to share one or more receptive field property. So for example, in V1, they all, all the neurons in this column would roughly look at the same part of visual space. They would roughly look at this part of visual space. And they roughly have the, all these neurons here have the same orientation. They're not all alike, they do all sorts of things. And it's not to say that all their properties are alike, but they always seem to share one or more properties. So in V1, it's orientation and, and, um, and receptive field location. In layer, in the input layer is different. Layer in the neurons in the input layer, 4B, typically tend to be not oriented. So you can see that here. Here, circle means those cells were not oriented. Now also, what, what the, um, uh, this is Michael here, what he showed is that um, C is color, so those are neurons that like, uh, that uh, seem to respond to select aspect of color, and again they cluster, right? They, here they occur together, and then they disappear, and here again you have a bunch of color neurons in here. And the dashed and do the solid and dashed line means left or right input. So the only place in the brain uh, where inputs are kept separate according to the right or to the left eye tends to be layer in, in V1, particularly in the, in, in close to the input layers. Uh, outside V1, information is merged so that if a neuron fires, you don't know did it fire because it got input from, a, from the right eye or from the left eye. And a very interesting fact that directly pertains to that is the psychological observation that if I shine a light into my eye, I shouldn't do this. Um, if I shine a light, I, I, I'm, I'm, this, is, this is what seems like a simple and stupid, stupid question. Was if I shine a tiny light into your eye and I shine into your right eye and your left eye, do you think you can tell whether it goes into your left or into your right eye? Now, one way to telling it, all right, so let's say I have tubes, and at the end of the tube there's a little light, an LED. Either it's on in the right eye or in my left eye. And I ask you, you know, tell me, so if you're guessing it's 50%, tell me whether the input came in the right eye or in the left eye. 
Now, one way to get that is to blink, right? If I blink and the light goes out, then I know it was the right eye. So I have to rule that out. And likewise, you know, if I move my head, I can, you know, do parallax. So I have to rule that out. If I'm careful enough, and if I, if I make it very bright, of course, my pupil uh, constricts. If I rule all of those things out, it turns out humans are very bad at telling uh, eye of origin. So it seems rather surprising that you cannot tell, you know, whether an input came in your right and your left eye. Now, you could argue ecologically that's okay because this doesn't really, it doesn't, there are no natural tasks that require you to know that explicitly. I mean, that's not to say that neurons in your brain don't have access to this information, but if you, you know, if I'm asking you a subject, was this input in the left or right eye, you don't have that information. It's quite remarkable. And it, it, it's interesting because that information is accessible in V1 explicitly, but it's not, apparently not made consciously accessible. Okay, but again, the point here is uh, neurons cluster. So here have a bunch of neurons that get input from the left eye, then from the right eye, then from the left eye. So that's, and again, in a column, they seem to be more or less of, um, of very similar types. This is a very important observation. Um, okay, actually, I'm missing one picture here. I should have. Because what you can do, for example, what you can do, um, screen. What people have done, they have again used uh, radioactive um, um, inject, for example, radioactive substances into one eye, and then and then that gets transported over a very day or a number of days to neurons in primary visual cortex, and then you can stain for radioactivity. And then if you sort of if you take again your V1, what you can see you can see these stripes. These are called ocular dominance columns. You know they have these. They, I mean they look like zebra. I can't really. They, they're very dense. I had the picture. I don't know where it is. So, for example, these all would be sort of these stripes where you have uh, neurons that are only driven by the left eye, only driven by the right eye. It really looks like a zebra pattern. And so that's a direct confirmation of, of columns, in this case, in the input structure, mainly in the input layers, mainly layer four, that seem to code for one and the same, for, for one and the same eye. But it's also true for color, color neurons cluster, and it's true for orientation. So you have this columnar property, which France, which Crick and I think is critical uh, because it relates to this, to this notion of explicit coding, that, that whenever you have a columnar property for something, in this case like for orientation or for location, that property is made explicit. Because you can directly, without a lot of further computation, you can directly read off the orientation of that stimulus, or you can directly read off the location of that stimulus from pooling uh, neurons in, um, within one of those columns. Okay, so, yeah, so in V1, and in different parts of the brain, you have columns for different things. You might have columns for, for tones, you might have columns for motion, for example, in this area MT we'll talk about, you have columns for faces, so in this area called infratemporal cortex, which is probably the best, the location where most of the neurons that directly give rise to visual consciousness sit, you have columns, you tend to have columns for, for faces, in other words, if you recall there and you find a neuron that likes faces, it tends to have lots of bodies. They tend to be just nearby. They tend not to be spread locally, uh, randomly, but they are all in local neighborhoods. The reason for this uh, columnar representation probably has to do with some sort of economy of wiring principle, that for developmental reasons and for wiring reasons, if you want, I mean, you, you saw how dense cortex is, right? So you can imagine that running wires is terribly expensive. And you want to minimize at all costs, you want to minimize how many long distance wire you have to run. Just because bulk, right? You can't make this brain any bigger anymore. It won't fit through the birth canal, right? So, so, so uh, you really have to economize on wiring. And so the argument goes, if you put things with similar properties nearby, then you have a lot, because that's where you tend to have lots of interaction that minimizes long distance wiring. And people have sort of had made, have made computational models of that. Okay. Let me tell you 15 minutes about, because next Wednesday we won't have lecture, it's a student faculty conference. So, um, and the lecture on Friday will be a short one, so, because normally I, will, um, I would have finished now, but let me give you um, this first part of the, of the next lecture, so then we can um, miss the one on Wednesday. So, um, I wanted to give you so it's a very popular term now. I saw it last week in an editorial, front page editorial in um, Nature, the NCC, the Neuronal Correlates of Consciousness. <clears throat> and what do we mean by that? Or what do other people now mean by that? So I wanted to talk about that. Okay, got to remember.
Purple and blue, not a good idea. <laughs> not a good idea. Okay, note to myself. Um, because people say, well, okay, so, so by, by the way, note that we're talking about correlates, neuronal correlates, because they're bound to be, this is biology after all, not physics, they're bound to be, you know, many, you know, correlates. Not guaranteed, but probably. So, the argument goes, well, we know, if you don't have your heart, you're not going to be conscious, right? Because if you, without your heart, leaving aside sort of machine support systems, you know, you're dead within very quickly. Well, in fact, yeah, <laughs> I recently read this paper. They did this study that in 1942, okay? And um, um, this is a study that would not pass human subject committee today anymore. What they did, they did this in hopefully volunteers, although I didn't say that. Um, the people who did this were at the Navy. And what they did, they rendered young men unconscious. And they wanted to see how long does it take for these people to be unconscious. So what they did, they applied cuff electrodes. They put cuff electrodes, I'm not going to demonstrate this here, around the, um, around the neck, around the carotis, interna, uh, externa, and um, they choked them. And, um, yeah, they, they, they uh, well, I mean, this was at a time when you didn't have human subject review boards, etc. Be that as it may, they, they talk about the um, average duration it takes these. So these are all, I didn't say, but I assume they're all recruits or sort of people in the army. So they're, they're all males. So they assume we're all in, in good health between 18 and 22 or something. So that population takes 6.9 seconds to become unconscious after they, after they choke this. Um, they wake up, they claim, I mean, in the paper they say they did not observe any long-term consequences, but of course they didn't track these people for a long time. Um, typically they, they wake up within a, within a minute or two and have some disorientation, but then quickly, uh, quickly recover. Um, it's another, this is interesting, oh, okay, I read this up because I was interested in how long does it take, it's just a little factoid to become unconscious. What's interesting for respect to consciousness is that some of these people, when they wake up, have vivid hallucinations. This relates, I was several times now on TV because people talk to me about, um, about consciousness and near-death experiences. So near-death experiences, which are now more prevalent, they're more prevalent than before, not because, well, not because of any metaphysical reason, but just because the medical technology has advanced to such a degree, to such an extent that people who previously, you know, had near-death, didn't have near-death experiences, they had death experiences, and so <laughs> they couldn't talk about them. No, but today, you know, with advanced medical technology, a lot of these people, particularly in hospital, when they have their second or third heart attack, they are already in hospital, they, they, they can survive, and so they can tell us about them. And two of the things, and I don't want to denigrate these experiences, if you talk to these people, they're very passionate about them, so there's, there's no question about them, they're not lying, or they're not trying to put one over you, or they're not hysteric. They have these very, very vivid experiences that um, A, there are a few physiological manifestations, like one is very often they go hand in hand with uh, um, light at the end of the tunnel syndrome. The other thing has to do with the vascularization of the retina, which is very dense in the fovea and much less dense in the surround. So well imagine, and some people, um, there's a second group of um, uh, patient, uh, normal, uh, normal humans, um, sorry, Air Force recruits, who, um, who um, they were also rendered unconscious, but as a, as a side effect, they spun them. This is in the 60s, 70s, and 80s when they test when they test people for you know high perform for test pilot or for astronauts, and they spin them in centrifuge, and they want to know at what point do do they become unconscious, at what g-force, and whether whether wearing you know full bo one of these body suits whether that um, that helps. And there you also have people some. You know, it's a huge variability at what G. The lowest guy fainted at 2, the, the, the one guy only fainted at 7G. And there people also report sometimes this, this tunnel syndrome. So I think that's a very simple physiological observation. But the other two observations, that the one striking, the one that strikes the, the public in near-death experiences is A, a very vivid imagery that every, that a lot, it turns out, as far, as far as I can tell, a lot of people have this imagery. But if you're now very religious, now put yourself in a situation, you're 70, 75, you know, you have some terminal disease, so you know you might die any moment, and you're very religious, and then very often this, this imagery or these dreams that these people have tend to be of a religious nature, like they saw, you know, God talk to them or whatever. And I don't for a moment doubt the 
you know, as Oscar Wilde famously said, you can't argue with perception. In, in a sense that I don't doubt that from their point of view, this is what they experienced, or at least that's their interpretation of their experience, and I don't, I, I think that's probably true. I mean, I had uh, dreams like that. Now, um, together it goes with a euphoric feeling, with a strange euphoria, not always, but very, but um, significant number of times that when people have this experience, they're very euphoric. And so, of course, it, in a sense, it's a God sent gift. Um, maybe it's a neuter term. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a gift because, you know, if you are terminal ill and you're, you have this vision and then you have, you have this euphoria, very, because very often these people then, uh, after they had this experience, they sort of, they seemed happy with their, with, with their fate. So, I mean, that cannot be, but good. Now, so I was interested in reading both these uh, studies, one of these uh, recruits that where they, 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 they were choked and the other set who were spun around till they fell unconscious because a number of times both subject groups reported when they woke up, very often they had intense visual imagery, and some of them had these euphoric feelings. Now, when you're 19 and the doctor tells you, okay, we're going to do this experiment, you might faint, but don't worry, and then you have imagery, you tend not to interpret it in, you know, in terms of near-death experiences, because the entire social, you know, religious context isn't there. So I think that, I mean, that to my mind could be the explanation. <clears throat> of course, it still begs um, the answer, why is it that when the brain wakes up, so the brain is unconscious, why? Because the, uh, there's no, uh, not enough oxygen transported because it's due to the gravity, it goes into your feet, or because you choke it. So then the, the brain cells very quickly fail to fire. They cannot fire anymore. They cannot support their gradients anymore, and they cannot generate action potential anymore. It's, it's an interesting question when, if you wake up, what, what parts of the brain wake up first? Is it first the brainstem and then the cortex? And what order is it? And why is it that this waking up very often goes hand in hand with this very intense imagery? And of course, it's something that we don't experience. If, if I become conscious every day and I have these experiences, I probably wouldn't make a big deal out of them, just like dreams. I mean, it's remarkable if you think about it, right? Every night you go to, the, I mean, this night I had such a vivid dream, I had an incredibly intense dream, and every night you wake up, you, you, you go to bed, you close your eyes, and you wake up in some world, and you have these amazing things happen to you. And if, if you never, if those things don't, never happen except once in your life, then of course it's something incredible special. So I think that's what makes these near-death experiences so special because they don't happen to most of us, more, you know, um, um, any time, and it happens only to a subset of people under these very, very special circumstances, and then they have these very um, ingenious, uh, in, ingenious explanations. Um, they actually did, there was a paper in Lancet, this is a British medical journal, where they actually, because some people, I mean, most people who talk about them have sort of new age and very religious um, explanations of these, including um, it's a related phenomenon that people, people sometimes have, which is uh, um, out-of-body experiences. That can also happen there. And where they do these bizarre, where one doctor actually did this exper experiment where he actually put information, he put a letter with big font on top of a, uh, of a, of a um, on top of a big, um, how do you call it? What? Yeah, on top of a cabinet. To, to make sure, is it really true when the patient <laughs> floats out of body, the patient could look down and actually read it. He said that, he said, and he found that the patient could not do that. And then he, and then he, then he actually said, and this is amazing, he said, well, that experiment would have, would have finally shown the reality of the existence of the soul. Which strikes me as, I mean, there's so many other explanations that you have to, that you have to look at it before, before you come to that uh, conclusion. Anyhow. Um, Okay, how did we, oh yeah, and you, yeah. so uh, to close several parentheses, um, uh, you could argue, well, clearly you need blood and oxygen. If you don't have that, you'll come unconscious. So therefore, the heart, um, you know, is, uh, is a college of conscience. In that sense, of course, it's true. So what uh, Francis and I mean, we mean the very, very specific factors that are necessary to mediate one specific percept. Right now, for example, the percept of this weak purple on, this, on the blue back, on that specific percept. Not the fact that all of you, unless you're sleeping, you have to be aroused. There have to be a number of enabling factors. Right? If you're not aroused, you're, you're sort of you're in, in, in coma or you know you're asleep. I don't I don't think anybody's in coma here. <laughs> I hope not. So so these are all the enabling factors that have to be present in order for you to be conscious at all. And there are a number of them, and people study them. Uh, they are, of course, terribly important for patients. If you you know uh, there are this entire lar unfortunately large group of patients who, uh, you know, typically uh, young, healthy, you know, otherwise healthy males, you know, is, uh, trauma, 
um, mainly trauma, car accidents, climbing, high, um, uh, 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 shooting, etc., that are that have various uh, uh, disturbances of conscious, permanent disturbance of consciousness, like coma or, or vegetative syndrome or persistent vegetative syndrome. Well, typically, what happens? You have damage to these uh, structures in the um, in the um, in the brainstem. See, I just wanted. So this is just a mini part. So the, 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 the brain stem tends to be sort of this part here. You can see why it's called the stem, right, for an obvious reason. This is a human brain for obvious reason, which comprises the midbrain, the pons, the medulla, and then here it goes into the spinal cord. So typically if you have... Le so the remarkable point is that many people have remarked, I can take out a big chunk of this part of the brain here, of cortex, and for the most part, un unless I look very careful, I won't make, I won't notice a difference in you. I mean, if 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 well, one of you had due to an accident or something, several cubic millimeter or cubic centimeters of cortex removed, um, and you know, then you heal, it would be difficult to know from an outsider. And one would have to do very specific and very sophisticated text, text, uh, tests to find that out. I mean, I, I believe that there, unless you're sort of younger than 14, when you have a huge amount of plasticity, but let's say it's certainly at my age, if I now lose a couple of uh, um, square centimeters of my, of my cortex, there would be some deficits, but I can probably compensate for that. And you would have to do a very careful test. On the other hand, you remove very small volumes, millimeter, cubic millimeter, of this part of the brain, for example, in the midbrain, or of part of the thalamus, particular, a particular part of the thalamus called intralamina nuclei. So the, thala, the, uh, the, the thalamus, this structure here, um, contains lots of different nuclei. As I mentioned to you, one, the best known one is called the LGN, the lateral geniculate nucleus, that mediates a specific visual information from the retina to, to, uh, um, to primary visual cortex. There are also other thalamic nuclei for vision, uh, for audition, etc. But then there are also some so-called unspecific thalamic nuclei, and one of them is a collection of nuclei called the intralamina nuclei. You make a tiny lesion in there, a cubic millimeter, you are in coma. If you lose both on both sides, you could be permanently in, in, in coma, although some of these patients do recover after a while. So it is quite remarkable that, that, that um, a large part, a destruction of large parts of cortex you can compensate, but destruction of small parts here in the, um, in the, in the, um, in the brainstem can lead to very, very severe and sometimes permanent deficits which might include things, you know, as co in coma or persistent or vegetative syndrome or persistent vegetative syndrome, where you sort of essentially just lie. You might have, you know, circadian rhythm, uh, or you might sometimes, you know, you might be able to follow your, uh, you know, to follow the, your eyes might follow sometimes, but in the worst case, nothing. You're just there as a sort of human vegetable. Very sad. Okay, so, so, so these are all the enabling factors. For example, we know there's this, there's this ma there are a number of, of systems in the, in the brainstem this was discovered here in the 40s, in partly in, in Los Angeles, called the midbrain or mesencephalic reticular formation. So this is a, a, a motley collection of 30 to 40 different nuclei that sit in this part of the brain, and that put, some of them project very, very widely. Like some of them, like in Lucas Cirolius, at 20,000 neurons, that one neuron might project here, here, and here, single axe and branches everywhere. And some of these structures are terribly important. They regulate sleep, they regulate arousal, they regulate learning, and without them, you're in deep, deep trouble. There's no question you need all these structures. But those are still enabling factors. You need them in order for your brain to be aroused, to be awake, to be able to learn. It does not explain in the, specific, uh, the specific content of my current visual or sensory um, consciousness. And so that's why I, I introduce this term. Many, many people, particular philosophers, make this distinction between content of consciousness, like right now you're conscious of my voice or you're conscious of this you know, laser dot or you're conscious of this word or something. That's a content of consciousness and consciousness as such. I don't think it's, I don't think it's all that useful because I'm not sure how good as a res for a research strategy that is. But, but a lot, lot of people do have this distinction. And so I think these enabling factors are necessary for consciousness as such. For any consciousness to occur, those enabling factors need to be present. If they're not present, I'm not conscious and there's no content. An interesting question is, I think really interesting, not, not even from philosophical, but from a practical point of view, can you have consciousness as such without content? And I think this is what some meditation techniques are trying to achieve. And, and there's been a lot, uh, I mean, a lot of writing on that. I mean, is it possible, uh, you know, for example, if you do Zen Buddhism, that, that, I mean, if you look at a lot of these techniques often involve focusing on one thing and then sort of trying to, un I mean, without falling asleep, and then sort of trying to, 
have even this thing sort of escape the clutches of your mind, so at the end you're sort of, you're conscious but not conscious of anything in particular. And maybe, I don't know, sort of pure rampant speculation, maybe that, that corresponds to conscience as such without content. It's not a very useful research strategy because I don't know how to do this in a monkey or in a mouse. I don't know how to get a monkey or a mouse, you know, to meditate and so... I've never seen any good evidence that there are specific, for example, that you can have a specific input from the brainstem. I'll show you. This, for example, is input from one set of, two sets of neurons in the, bas in the um, uh, basal forebrain called the basal nucleus of Maynard, and here in another part of the, uh, of the mesencephalic uh, reticular activating system, they project here and they project very widely. So some of those neurons might project, you know, across half the brain. I've never seen any evidence that for example, they can only innervate part of V1 and only innervate part of somatosensory cortex. I've never, I mean, that might, that, that might exist. I just, have, I, I, just don't, I just don't think there is evidence such that for that degree of specificity. That's why I think you need these things in order to be aroused, in order to be able to learn. You know, when something happens suddenly, you know, and, I mean, for, and for those sorts of things, or to enable me to learn. I, I don't think it's involved in specific content. It might enable you, for example, it might generate, it might facilitate uh, oscillations, but it would do that throughout large parts of the brain. So remember that illusion I showed you in the very first class, when you sometimes see the yellow spots and sometimes not, right? Again, where's the difference between the, those two states? And I don't think it has anything, you know, sometimes you are just conscious of the yellow spots, sometimes you're not conscious of them. I don't think that difference relates at all to differences in, for example, these sorts of uh, widely broadcasting uh, systems. So they, you can think of it like a broadcast on a, on a, you know, on a network or something, or something with a bullhorn. Because these neurons here sort of widely broadcast to very large parts of the brain. This shows you a, a functional imaging study of this. So this shows you, um, this is a um, uh, PET study, a positron emission tomography, done in, um, in Stockholm, I think, by Per Roland, on Uppsala, somewhere in Sweden, where they showed... Um, where they essentially you can see they, they had, um, the upshot is they had people do different attention tasks where you either had to attend to a visual stimulus or you had to attend to a, a tactile stimulus. And then they compared that against just quietly lying in the, in, the, in, in the machine without attending to anything. And two parts of the brain always lit up. It's maybe a little bit difficult to see here. Uh, lights all off. Okay, so you can see this is, so this is the thalamus here and here. You can see, so this is, I mean, these are small structures, the intrathalamic nuclei. You can see they're active here and here. And then here, this is sort of the, um, um, the top of the midbrain, the segment of the midbrain, they're active here and here. And here it's a, it's a, it's a different view. This is just a structural MI. Um, this is PET. So, so this just shows that, that if you really need to attend to something, you really need to pay attention to something, Again, it, these structures seem to be active. So it is, it, it is wh what that probably says that with, uh, the, you need those structures in order to be able to attend to anything at all. But, it, but the fact is that these are active, whether you're doing visual or tactile, already tells you that it doesn't relate to the specific content of what you're attending. It just sets the baseline that you can attend. That, that you can attend. So any, anytime you really need to concentrate on something, these structures are, are active and involved. Okay, this is my last slide today. So, um, yeah, so, so, so it is important when you talk about correlates, A, there are correlates, and there's probably not going to be one, and want to distinguish the, the enabling factors from the, from the, um, from the uh, I think this is the right light, from the specific factors, and we are always looking for the specific factors that mediate, because ultimately we care about the subjective feelings. Where does the subjective feeling come from? This, this buzz you have when you see something or smell something or hear something, right? Where does the pain come The awful, the painful of pain comes from. And, I mean, in vision you have this very nice illusion that where you can rapidly switch. You don't have them for pain. Because, so that's one reason why it's so much more difficult to study the neurobiology biology of pain, because it's more difficult to recruit subjects. <laughs> But, 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 you know, so again, those, those things are all, they are necessary, those, 
brainstem reticular activating system and intralaminar nucleus, but if you want to, see, want to understand where the specific buzz of seeing the yellow or not seeing it comes from, you have to look, basically you have to look in the forebrain. You have to look in cortex, in neocortex, in thalamus, and in rela closely related structures. Just a few points I wanted to tick off. They, they expanded at, at, at more depth in the, in the uh, today's chapter. So the, the, the chapter that I'm talking about today right now is in next week's lecture. It's already out. One's emotions. So I spent a lot of time uh, two years ago, well, I spent a couple of weekends with psychoanalysts. They were very interested in, in conscious, or they have, of course, always been interested in consciousness, and they, they were trying to understand what sort of modern neuroscience has to say about some of those, some of the things they're interested in. And um, um, the thing with emotion is that, of course, for humans, emotions are terribly important. No question about it. Um, However, emotions, and people are now beginning to study the emotion, the neurobiological basis of emotion, particularly fear, because that's easy to study in animals. It's difficult to study the biological basis of happiness, although I think that would be nicer. But the basic point about emotion is they do not fundamentally change the nature of the problem. And, they become, and right now, I think it's all about tactics, trying to find the most easiest and the best model system where you can tackle these problems. And the claim, the, 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 I mean, our belief is that, uh, you know, let's say, take a student, I mean, you know, you could do the following experiment with somebody called Zeki has tried to do in London. You can take, for example, graduate, undergraduate students who are in love and those who are not in love. You try to somehow normalize for gender and you try to normalize for all sorts of other things you can think of. And then, you know, you can try to study sort of, you know, and he has done that using, you know, using FMI to see if there any different response to a picture of the loved one. You know, it's a more strong, more powerful response when you look at the, the object of your uh, adulation. Um, but, fa but fundamentally, whether you're, in, I mean, for example, it's claimed that when people are in love, you know, colors look more vibrant, right? R reds look more, uh, r roses look more red and all of that stuff. And of course, it's, you know, it, that's sort of what 90% of the airways are filled with songs about that topic. I've yet to see any test of that. I've yet to see actually any dispassionate sort of evidence that that's actually true, that you see colors differently when you're in love than when you're not in love. But furthermore, even if that's true, I think at best it's a modulation. I mean, at best, it's no, it's no question about it when I'm sad or happy or elated. I perceive the way the world's slightly different, or I might, pay, I might pay attention to different things when I'm happy than when I'm sad. But in both, in all these cases, there is always feeling. And the fundamental, I mean, I just don't, I've never seen any evidence that, for example, this blue, you know, you might see it slightly different when, you, I, I'm willing to admit the possibility, although I've not seen any tests, that when you're in love, you see this blue is slightly different hue than when you're not in love, okay? But at best, that's going to be a basic modulation. It's not going to change the fundamental fact that, you know, you, that you see this blue, and the blue has a distinct relationship to red. Or, for example, this illusion I showed you with the yellow spots, you're going to see that whether you're in love or not or whether you're angry or not. When you're angry, you might not want to focus at it a long time because you're angry at something else, but, 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 but that's a different point. So the bottom line is that emotions are, are in, incredibly important to us, and we need to understand the neural basis, particularly what goes wrong in various emotional diseases, but it does not change the fundamental nature of the beast that we need to explain, and it doesn't provide any, any good experimental um, uh, paradigm to test. Anesthesia. When I first got into the problem of consciousness uh, 12 years ago, I, I had a very good friend who was an anesthesiologist, so I talked with him a lot. In fact, we wrote a paper together, and I dug, I, I dug in a lot of books on anesthesia. So what anesthesiologists do professionally, they get paid a lot of money for that, they render you unconscious, right? They render you unconscious in a very controlled way. In, in fact, their task is much more difficult because the people they have to render unconscious very often are already terrible impaired. They're either very old and frail or they just had a near deadly you know, um, 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 accident on a, on a freeway. So, so, um, so it's a very difficult job. Now, most books at the time when I read, most books on anesthesiology didn't even have an index entry on unconsciousness. Okay, this was my first very striking observation. Um, and when I talked, you know, I went to a dentist at the time, I went to another doctor, I, I, you know, I tried to engage him to try to find out, and they said, don't worry, don't worry, you won't have, a, you won't have pain. I said, well, I, that, that's okay, but when I understand, I'm really unconscious, don't worry, don't worry, you won't remember a thing. And that's what it comes down to. So there, there are several books that I have now and that have been published um, called Awareness and Anesthesia. 
And so this is something that, that doctors are, are, are aware of, as it, as it were, and are concerned with. But ultimately, what the anesthesiologist cares, A, is the subject stable? In other words, is his you know, blood system, uh, his blood pressure, et cetera, stable? Is sympathetic nervous system stable? Is, is, does he have any pain? And does he have any memory? And if the end, and does he move? Because if he moves, clearly not a good idea. So what you do in modern anesthesiological practice, you give cocktails of, of multiple of multiple agents. You give you know you give something an antiparalyticum, I mean to specific to paralyze a patient so he doesn't jump off the table when you do the cut. You give him anti-anxiety drugs. You give him drugs that knocks out memory and recall. Uh, you give drugs to stabilize his his blood pressure. And so you use all these different ones. But 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 that is of course not identical with actually the patient being unconscious. And there are lots of cases in the 30s and 40s, 50s. When people first discovered the use of curare, you know, when, when it came, first came, I guess, in the 19th century from South, uh, South Africa, uh, uh, South America, when people thought it was an anesthetic home, well, in fact, curare doesn't anesthetize you at all. It just paralyzes you, but you're still inside. You want to scream, but you can't because you, are, you, you can't do that anymore. And so if you read these accounts of people um, uh, who wake up under anesthesia, usually it is... Uh, during the biggest insult, let's see, when you do the first abdominal cut, because that's, of course, a big insult to the system, you wake up. Usually these people don't report pain because pain is treated separately, but they report an absolutely horrifying experience, right? You're not being told, you're, in general, people, and they've changed now over the last 10 years, so now they tell you ahead of time there's this possibility this might happen. But so recently they didn't tell you this experience at all, and you're trying to communicate desperately to the doctor to tell them something's wrong, but you can't because... You're, you're paralyzed, and most people who have this probably don't remember it even afterwards because you, you, you're given these drugs to, not, to, uh, render you, to uh, minimize anxiety and memory recall. Now, on the other hand, I found it very disappointing what we could learn from anesthesiology about consciousness. The reason is that all anesthetic drugs so far, they work globally. They work at the receptor level. They interfere with specific receptors. Specifically, they, potent they potentiate GABA, the inhibitor neurotransmitter, or they interfere with glutamate or NMDA, with excitatory neurotransmitters, but they do it throughout large parts of the brain. And so far, the, the upshot is, I mean, we could give an entire lecture, this on anesthesiology, we have not learned a lot about the uh, effect, the global effect of, um, of anesthesia on, on consciousness. It's not true that, for example, V1 is intact, and some other brain areas totally shut down. In fact, a lot of the early exploration of visual cortex, in fact, even the discovery of first of the face cells, you know, the cells I showed you uh, uh, two lectures ago, they were in fact done in a lightly anesthetized animal. So th it is true that even in a lightly anesthetized animal, you can get a nuance to respond. You know, you, the, the, the monkey is asleep, it's anesthetized, you pop open its eyes, and you can get very, sometimes quite selective responses, although the animal is anesthetized. So it's not true that in anesthetic, for example, your brain is shut down. In fact, today, there's not a single conscious ometer around. I mean, wouldn't it be nice to have a tool, like Dr. Spock has, that you can point at a patient and you can read off sort of some sort of scale of level of anesthesia, uh, uh, level of consciousness, or you, read, you, know, you do with EG. In general, uh, if, you average, uh, if you look across the entire class of different anesthetic agents, there's no, um, no, simple, no single signature of consciousness that we can use in a clinical sense today that would tell us, is that patient in front of me unconscious or not? I can tell you, or doctors can tell you, for very specific type of anesthetic, they all have experiences. You know, for this type of ketamine or something, you know, if you do the EG and you do spectral analysis, the patient will go through these steps, and at this point, the patient is unconscious, and that's true because it's based on hundreds of thousands of cases. But we do not have a general signature of consciousness that I can apply in a, in, a, in, a, in a, you know, that I can take a patient and attach some sort of electrodes and tell, tell you this patient is, is unconscious. I can tell you the patient is paralyzed and doesn't move and doesn't have pain and, may, and probably doesn't remember. But of course, that is not identical with being unconscious. So I'm leaving you with that observation to think about the next time you go have anesthesia taken.